Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today we're going to delve into a wonderful reading from a book by Marion Weinstein that really talks about how to use words to transform your life. We use affirmations all the time on this channel. We've talked about it in a variety of different ways. And this particular reading coming from a very powerful book that I highly recommend called Positive Magic really discusses how to use words of power to transform your life. Marianne Weinstein was famously known as the New York Witch. She is one of the first to talk about positive magic. And she was a radio host, a comedian, a teacher. Her book was published and continues to be treasured by many as a practical guide to spiritual theory and practice. In particular, I wanted to go over this chapter on words of power and more specifically, what kind of words to use in whatever situation that you're in and how to think about affirmations in the proper way as a form of transformation. Weinstein begins by saying heat creates energy. This is signified by the wind stirred up by the fire and issuing forth from it. This represents influence working from within outward. In order to be capable of producing such an influence, one's words must have power. And this they can have only if they are based on something real, just as flame depends on its fuel. The I Ching Book 1, Hexagram 37. I have defined magic as transformation. And this will deal with specific positive transformation techniques. Following the ideas that I've previously discussed, if you have transcended your perceptions of time and space, begun to accept responsibility for your own karma, made the distinctions between positive and negative work, perceived your link with the rest of the cosmos, and embarked upon the techniques of divination, you've probably already experienced some degree of transformation in your life by now. I hope it is clear that we are capable of directing and controlling our own lives. That the outer reality, the world of form, need not dominate us. That there is no power greater than that of the self when the self is perceived in harmony with the rest of the cosmos. The potential of transformation to be wrought by the self probably is now apparent, and the work in this is simply the next step. Transformation can manifest in many ways. There is an entire field of entertainment also called magic, which is actually a simulation, an imitation of the kind of transformation which can be affected by occult work. Such simulated magic includes prestigitation or sleight of hand, a technique causing material objects to seem to disappear and appear or change. In the occult, the same phenomena can occur, not by trickery, but by actual changes in the molecular structures of the objects. Science prefers to call this the paranormal, psychokinesis, parapsychology, and other technical sounding terms. We are discovering that such phenomena can be measurable. Scientific experiments have proven that the world of form is flexible, far more flexible than it may have seemed to be. When Yuri Geller, the Israeli psychic, came on my show, he bent silverware, keys, and other familiar inflexible objects. He did not apply intense physical pressure. He did not flex his muscles, strain, or force these objects to bend. I still treasure a stainless steel butter knife of my mother's, which Yuri bent in half without any obvious physical force. For me, this was a dramatic illustration of how flexible the world of form can be. But there were people in the studio whose perceptions did not allow them to accept or believe what was happening, even though they saw this with their own eyes. These people insisted it must be a trick. I know that for Yuri and others with similar gifts such as skepticism has been a common reaction. Of course, sometimes in stage magic, it is a trick. That is, there are tricks which make a metal object look as if it is bending. But in the occult, we know that such phenomenon can also be real. 
that actual change can manifest physically. Within the occult frame of reference, we can say that those people who categorically refuse to believe that this is possible are people who have chosen not to let their own world of form be flexible. And of course, that choice is according to their own free will. According to my own witchcraft beliefs, bending a fork or a key is only a symbol. Changing a life for the better is probably more relevant. But a symbol is important for it represents bending a fork or changing a life are the same thing. Both work in the same way. Both are transformation. The transformation of physical matter as a symbol of a psychological and spiritual transformation was a task of alchemy. The great work of alchemy was not meant primarily to transform base metal into gold, as it is so frequently misunderstood. The goal was to transform the alchemist's psyche in profound ways, as Pauls and Bergier state in The Morning of the Magicians. For the alchemist, it must never be forgotten that power over matter and energy is only a secondary reality. The real aim of the alchemist's activities, which are perhaps the remains of very old science belonging to a civilization now extinct, is the transformation of the alchemist himself, his accession to a higher state of consciousness. The material results are only a pledge of the final result, which is spiritual. Young has devoted an enormous body of study to this idea, as he puts it. Certainly gold making, as also chemical research in general, was of great concern to alchemy. But a still greater, more impassioned concern appears to have been, one cannot very well say that the investigation, but rather the experience of the unconscious. The important point here is the world of form is flexible if we let it be. It may seem paradoxical that an essential starting point to remember when we set out to change the world of form in any way is that the invisible world must be granted equal validity. As the I Ching says, all that is visible must grow beyond itself, extend into the realm of the invisible, thereby it receives its true consecration and clarity and takes firm root in the cosmic order. Book 1, Hexagram 50 The work of magic involves both worlds and involves them equally the world of form and the invisible world. It is only natural that our initial focus should be on the world of form because we are living in it, in physical bodies, on the earth plane, here, as the Kabbalah terms it, in Malkuth. It is desirable that we work magic to change or improve the form of our lives. We are aware that such work both symbolizes and begins a much larger work, as in alchemy. All magic or transformation by its very nature involves the entire cosmos. One of the working principles is that we are all microcosms of the infinitely larger whole. Thus it is important to bear in mind that the work of magic, even when applied to the individual, extends beyond our immediate perceptions and our initial goals. It may seem as if my emphasis is more on the invisible than the visible but I shall merely be emphasizing the invisible now in order to achieve a balance. Unfortunately, our culture has gone so far in emphasizing the importance of the world of form that many of us may have forgotten entirely about the importance of the invisible. Or we may acknowledge the invisible, but not know how to relate to it, nor how to work with it. We may be caught in the Western thought mode of relating to the invisible. But the same set of guidelines and definitions which we use for the world of form. If you have perceived the world of form as inflexible and operative within certain limits, you might automatically have carried these definitions over to your perceptions of the invisible world. This view of the invisible world has led to many limited dealings with it, specifically in the West. Such a view has led to the concept of supervision by an external god or gods and to deductions about the ways the god or gods may work. It has led to a sense of resignation to the concept of fate, luck, and destiny, and to the belief in various kinds of outer-directed powers which seem to rule our lives. Such a view has also led to fear and superstition, and a desire to placate these invisible forces. Especially when confronted by anything which does not fit into our limited perceptions and definitions of the invisible. 
According to occult belief, one of the attributes of the invisible world is that as we define it, so it seems to manifest in accordance with our definitions. In other words, the invisible world reflects an image back to us according to whatever we project onto it. If we believe and project that fate is arbitrary, so the invisible world will appear to consist of an arbitrary fate. If we believe that the invisible world is harmonious and orderly, so will it demonstrate to us harmony and order. Actually, the invisible world cannot be defined in familiar terms. The first thing to acknowledge is that any definitions, any rules, any delineations we may use for the invisible world are our own choices. Our choice here will be to view the invisible world as the place of cause and the world of form as the place of effect. Our choice will then be to begin with our ideas, which are invisible. We will perceive that our ideas can manifest into forms which are visible ideas. In this context include emotions, thoughts, beliefs, and other mental processes. I have chosen to use ideas as a catch-all term mainly because the word seems to connote change. In Jane Roberts, the nature of personality which embodies techniques similar to the words of power the term belief is used. We will perceive that many of our past ideas have occurred on a subconscious level, and the ideas have manifested as the forms for our circumstances in our lives. This process of cause and effect has also been subconscious. We will now bring into conscious awareness this process of ideas into forms. We will direct the cause and effect process in our lives to affect changes. According to this method, we can view the entire world of form and everything in it as manifestations of invisible ideas. The earth plain Malkuth is the place where ideas manifest into form, and this is where we have chosen to live. Here we may see around us evidence of ideas manifest into forms. Animals, trees, flowers, stars, oceans, all of nature. Each form is a perfect living idea and so are we perfect living ideas in form of our invisible selves our souls and so every aspect of our lives is an idea which we have caused to manifest into a form if we change an idea therefore the correlating form consequently will change this technique may be viewed as sequential we will use the invisible world first by employing a sequence of ideas spoken in words, the changes will manifest later in the world of form in our lives. We will use words as the causes and note the changes in our lives as the effects. Most Western magic works with the law of cause and effect, and in this way, it is in accordance with the threefold law of the witches and with many positive ceremonial magic traditions. If we understand that we exist in simultaneous time, all time is now, we can then make the conscious choice to work in sequential or linear time. But we are aware that linear time is not the only time mode available to us. If we understand that we live in multidimensional space, all space is here, then we can choose consciously to work with a system which manifests in tangible form on the earth plane. It is also important to understand the system of using words to trigger these changes is just one of many possible systems. We could use images, diagrams, thought forms, rituals, meditation, shifts in emotions, or other techniques. The use of words is particularly appropriate for dealing with daily life on the earth plane at this point in Western culture. Words are symbols. They represent ideas, which are invisible. Yet, words themselves can be visible as written on a page or otherwise perceived tangibly by our immediate senses. Even unsighted people can use words via hearing or by the use of braille. Deaf people can use a sign language or think the words. Anyone accustomed to working 
with his or her immediate senses, can build a bridge to the invisible realm by way of words. They help us to span both worlds. Words are tools. They work in invisible ways to create visible results. It is vital when using words for working magic to use the language you understand best. You can most accurately express the clarity and subtlety of your ideas in this way. Your work will be more effective and safer than if you use unfamiliar words. It is true that a psychic buildup has occurred in the traditional magic words of some languages. Indeed, people believe some languages to have been especially devised for use in magic, for example, Hebrew. But since it is important to acknowledge your total responsibility and control from the outset, make sure you use the language you speak and write most easily in your own words of power. It is vital to strip away any mystery or confusion from the work which might subtly give power away from the self. Remember the power in doing magic comes from you and your words direct the power. Your own words will serve you better than someone else's most eloquent incantations. History. The use of words in magic and religion is as old as language itself. Verbal techniques of dealing with the invisible may be divided into two categories, supplication and affirmation. Supplication may be defined as any technique of dealing with a higher power or powers, which is believed to be greater than human and existing on a more elevated plane outside of human experience. Often the power seems to be viewed as a sort of mighty parent or parents, and in contrast, humans are but children. The higher power may seem to move in mysterious ways, may seem awesome frightening and impossible for a mere human to comprehend or in contrast it can be merciful compassionate protective and the giver of all life in any case such a power seems to be basically separate from the human entity a primitive response to such a power has been trying to please and to get the god on our side or to decide that god is on our side this conviction can lead to the justification of barbaric behavior such as holy war or the persecution of other religions and races generally anything which seems outside of human understanding is ascribed to that deities of powers will including death birth intense emotion and dramatic manifestations of nature supplication involves an acknowledgement of the human self as below the higher power the process can involve entreaty for the deity to take care of the humans who are worshiping. This worship may be expressed in a number of ways. Sacrifices, either symbolic sacrifices of an animal or placing money or food in prescribed holy place. Self-sacrifice, avoidance of certain foods or fasting, avoidance of sex or even self-flagellation or other forms of physical discomfort. Symbolic self-abasement, kneeling, groveling, bowing down. Verbal self-abasement, acknowledgement of the self as impure, humble, unimportant, etc. in relation to the higher power. Many forms of prayer, begging God to be merciful and kind in general or to grant a specific favor. The kind of prayer can vary from the loftiest request, such as to save a life or protect a country, to the most gross, please kill the enemy, to the most childlike, please don't let me fail this exam. A practice which has arisen out of prayer, a supplication in the West, has been to make a deal with God. One often hears of people who promise God in a moment of danger that if only He would rescue them, they would be good from then on, generally or in specific ways. Some people who make deals with God, even without any immediate threat or danger, assume if they perform in a certain way, God may also perform in a certain way. Supplication often provides a framework for people to act in a righteous way only because it is calculated to guarantee the power's favor. 
Some forms of prayer, however, have an element of affirmation because they affirm a connection to the deity on some level. The affirmation technique assumes the human entity's existence as part of the higher power. Affirmation acknowledges the unity of all life, the oneness of all life, and consequently affirms the concept that the higher power is as much inside the self as outside. Some religions have begun by advocating affirmation and have then turned to condoning or encouraging supplication. It was believed that affirmation was a technique which only the priests and other religious leaders were capable of understanding. The populace wasn't enlightened enough. Many holy people who understood affirmation tried to teach it to their followers, and the followers simply ended up worshipping whoever was trying to teach it to them. Another problem surrounding this work is that one may find various organizations claiming ownership of affirmation techniques. Actually, the basic technique is a heritage available to all of us. Affirmation comes from the collective unconscious. The technique may even be arrived at by a process of deduction from basic occult and metaphysical principles. Throughout the history of magic and religion, there have been numerous versions of affirmation and one hears of many names and descriptions for it. I have chosen to call it words of power, mainly because I traced the process historically back to the ancient Egyptian goddess, Isis, and this is the term she used. Come to me for my speech hath in it the power to protect, and it possesseth life, for I am Isis, the goddess, and I am the lady of words of power, and I know how to work with words of power, and most mighty are my words. Isis was worshipped as a goddess in ancient Egypt but some of the legends surrounding her may have been based upon the life of an actual person. She is described as having used words of power to cause miracles, primarily healing, and bringing the apparently dead and dying back to life. Isis restored her murdered husband brother, Osiris, to such a state of vitality that they conceived a child, Horus. It seems that the ancient Egyptians who worshipped Isis did not know how to use words of power themselves. Instead, they revered as deities the legendary figures who had this knowledge. Isis was said to have learned words of power from her father. The sun god Ra. Ra was believed to be the one god or primal essence, and all the other gods and goddesses were considered to be manifestations or forms of him. My theory is that when Isis learned that she was part of the divine power, her own words took on power as well. In ancient and classical civilizations, beginning with the Vith dynasty in Egypt circa 2900 BC, and continuing through Greek and Roman periods to the first century CE, it seems that the popular religions led by priests and priestesses worshipped a pantheon of gods and goddesses all primarily in the mode of supplication. However, the traditions surviving from these times through occult sources indicate a continuous thread of at least three main mystery schools that handed down affirmation techniques in secret to a select group of initiates. These occult groups are the mysteries of Isis, the Eleusinian mysteries of Greece, including the Dianic branches related to Celtic witchcraft, and the Roman mysteries. There's only one ancient civilization in which affirmation seems to have been practiced by most of the population. It is a legendary civilization at that, Atlantis. Legends about Atlantis agree on one main point. Many people had access to the use of some great mysterious mental power, and its misuse caused the entire civilization of Atlantis to self-destruct. Witchcraft is an ancient religion which traces its roots back to these early magic traditions. In fact, I believe that it goes even further back in time, despite the fact that some of the craft sects today worship the goddess and the god as externalized deities. Witchcraft works primarily by affirmation. The power is believed to emanate from within. Witchcraft often employs combination of ritual, sympathetic magic, and rhymed and or chanted words of power. These are symbolic techniques intended to aid in the concentration and focus of the use of the power. Thus, spells, charms, chants, and magic words in witchcraft terms 
or affirmation techniques. Folk magic, on the other hand, is primarily supplication based as it is on superstition. One might say that folk magic technically is not magic at all, but a placating system based on fear of an external power. In ancient Judaism, the original high priest of the first temple seemed to have had a knowledge of affirmations. It is said that they knew and could pronounce the secret name of God. However, the majority of the ancient Hebrews seemed to have prayed mainly by supplication. After the destruction of the temple, a succession of conquering groups, primarily the Romans, eliminated the hereditary position of high priests, so that the priesthood became a political rather than spiritual office. Consequently, the people serving as high priests eventually became corrupt until the office of high priest disappeared. The exact sequence of events surrounding this time seemed to be buried in a mist of legends recounted from the non-adept's point of view. In any case, after this period, the knowledge of affirmation techniques in Judaism seemed to have been left mainly to those few scholars immersed in the lifetime study of the Kabbalah. The goal of this study, stated simplistically, is to reach a heightened state of spiritual consciousness which is manifest in knowing and pronouncing the secret name of God. The Old Testament provides clues that affirmation may have been practiced by a few holy people. The stories about the miracles surrounding the life of Moses indicate that he may have learned something of Egyptian magic, including the words of power tradition, since the Bible seems to have been translated and handed down primarily by non-adepts it is difficult to figure out what the mode of communication with the higher power may have been. Was it affirmation or supplication? I believe that the holy people and religious leaders made use of affirmation and the common folk practiced supplication. In any case, it seems clear that since biblical times, the major emphasis in popular Judaism has been to worship and pray via supplication. The minor emphasis has followed a lesser known spiritual tradition in which advanced levels of study and prayer lead to a form of affirmation, a oneness with the God force. There are numerous legends from the non-adept's point of view about the wonder rabbis who could perform miracles because they had learned the name. These rabbis were said to have been able to fly, bilocate, create the golem, humanoid man of clay, heal, exercise evil spirits, and perform other superhuman deeds. In the New Testament, the miracles and healings of Jesus indicate the use of affirmation techniques. In fact, it is possible that Jesus attempted to teach affirmation to his followers. If this is the case, within a short period of time, the original intent may have been distorted into a veneration of the teacher to the exclusion of understanding the teachings. Note Mark 12, 23. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Styles. In the past century, several religious philosophical organizations have emerged which teach affirmation techniques within the Judeo-Christian tradition. For example, religious science terms the method treatment in unity. It is called an affirmative prayer, and affirmative meditation. These techniques are particularly helpful to people who wish to pursue affirmation in a way which is compatible with Western Judeo-Christian concepts of prayer. Essentially, these groups work with the idea that God is within, and they place a metaphysical interpretation upon traditional prayers and biblical passages. Thus, it is not necessary to depart from more traditional monotheistic religious tradition in order to work with some form of affirmation. You may also come across organizations which teach affirmation in a number of other styles, occult, metaphysical, psychological, even Eastern. Some are eclectic and borrow from various styles. These groups may use such key terms as mind expanding, consciousness raising, sensitivity training, dynamic, mind power, awareness or control. Whatever course of study you may undertake, I'd like to remind you of the compendium of modern dangers. Please watch out and be careful not to hand over any of your own power or control of your life to anyone. This has been a problem for many people 
to inadvertently transfer their reverence, fear, and awe and responsibility previously assigned to God, fate, or any outside force over to a group leader. And some group leaders, either intentionally or subconsciously, might well accept such a role. This can happen even in the midst of teaching self-responsibility, self-determined karma, the concept of God within. This contradiction, as I have said earlier, is a cusp phenomena. In the Aquarian age, I believe it will no longer pose a problem, but please watch out for it now. Ideally, the style of affirmation you choose to work with should not contradict anything you deeply believe. Affirmation should feel harmonious with your way of thinking and your way of life. And it should fulfill your needs. The most appropriate style for you can emerge organically out of you understanding of the content. I have attempted to keep the instructions for words of power in this book as non-sectarian as possible. Thus, I hope you'll be able to translate them into whatever style you wish. Perhaps even evolve a style all your own. But please be aware that I am drawing upon a personal style of affirmation in case you hadn't noticed. Yes, it is witchcraft, specifically the style of the witchcraft blessing. So now before you get into the non-sectarian instructions for working words of power, I offer you, in my own style, a witchcraft blessing to guide the way. It only applies to you if you want it to. The one power that moves the moon moves through you. The power that lights the sun lights your life. It is female and it is male. It is clouds and rain. It lives in the damp earth, in root and in bud. It moves the wind. It is all life, born and unborn, on this plane and in the next, visible and invisible, in planet and star. It is infinite. It blesses and protects, heals and creates. It moves backwards and forwards in time, through all of space, in this life, and in myriad others yet to come, and in the past as well, this power is yours as it is mine. It is goddess, and it is God. Use it for the good of all, and according to the free will of all, with ease and with joy, to bless your life, and so mote it be. The work of words of power is based on the traditional witchcraft concept that we live simultaneously in two worlds, the worlds of form and the invisible realm. The world of form is that which seems to exist outside ourselves. It may seem that we have no control over it. We do have control over it. The world of form is more flexible than our current culture may have led us to believe. The invisible realm is the area in which ideas are born. These ideas are later manifest as form. If we wish to direct and control the forms of our lives, we begin by working in the invisible realm. Here we need guidelines. A misunderstanding of the invisible realm has led to such misconceptions as destiny, fate, and popular superstitions. These are all ideas which relate to the concept of an outer power. In the invisible realm, there is no outer power or force more powerful than the power of the self. Here are the guidelines. These are basic universal principles born out of traditional witchcraft beliefs. These guide the work according to the stance between the two worlds, the world of form and the invisible world. We work between the worlds. Words of power, basic principles for positive occult work. One, for the good of all. All the work of magic must be done for the good of all only. Within the context of our current culture, the principle may seem hard to comprehend. It may be necessary to simply state it at first, even before our conscious minds have grasped the principle. It literally means that every magic work we do works for the good of everyone. This includes you, the worker, everyone involved in the situation, and ultimately every living being. The universe works in perfect harmony, and we on the human level also 
fit into this ideal, infinitely perfect harmony. Our needs do not oppose this principle which are in harmony with it. If we work to fulfill our needs, this work by definition hurts no one and helps everyone. No ifs, no buts, no pluses. It includes all. This does not mean manipulation. So and so must suffer or give in or lose even a little for this thing to come about. No. It does not mean compromise. I must give in a little, suffer or compromise a bit for this work for everyone's good. No. It does not mean deprivation, nor does it mean rationalization. You can't have everything. No. So you, the worker, will be fulfilled and the people involved will be fulfilled according to their needs. This does not mean according to your definition of their needs. It means according to the free will and receptivity of all. And everything will literally turn out for the best. This is based on the concept of natural universal harmony, which means, too, the universe as macrocosm. The universe is comprised of harmony, the infinite and complete unity of all life. The power is the life force of the universe, and in sense, synonymous with it. We are all inheritors of the power, and the power holds no favorites. It exists equally in everything and everyone. When we are in tune with it, we are in tune with the perfect balance of the universe. And three, the microcosm, that's each of us. That's the self. We are each individualizations of the power. And anything the power can do, we can do. The power can create worlds, stars, planets, babies, and we can create. The universe is complete. It has everything it needs. And we are complete. We potentially have everything we need. We have the infinite resources of the power to bring about the work of positive magic, to make our potential into reality. The way I like to perceive the self as microcosm is we are each goddess, we are each god. All of the power is ours to draw upon by acknowledging this infinite perfection of the power in each and every being. We, as microcosms, are each the centers of our own universes, of our own lives. Thus, we may benefit from the conscious use of the natural law which keeps everything in the universe running smoothly. 4. The Law of Cause and Effect All you physicists out there already know about this. Well, physics and magic work in the same way. The law of cause and effect is the basis of all life on this plane and of this work. Please keep in mind that at this level we are working with the concept of linear, sequential time in which the cause comes before the effect. Modern physics has begun to work with the idea of effects coming before causes as may be proven by the existence of tachyons, particles believed to move faster than the speed of light. In this work, the words of power are the cause, and the results or manifestations are the effect. The cause often takes place in the unseen realm, and the effect usually manifests in the world of form. Much of the most powerful positive magic we may work happens through conscious, directive use of the law of cause and effect. We achieve our desired effects by setting up carefully the appropriate causes. Consequently, any negative work is also subject to this law. Thus, if anyone is foolish or irresponsible enough to work in a manipulative or harmful way, then manipulation and harm automatically come back to the worker, and sometimes this happens where least expected. Remember, the witches believe that everything comes back threefold. I cannot guarantee the number of times something comes back to you, but I can assure you that everything does come back when you are working with words of power and you are very specific, specific things come back. This is the simple, inevitable use of the power. In negative magic, cursing comes back, wishing harm comes back, inflicting pain or death comes back. Yes, eventually, it all comes back to the worker, the individual who set up the negative cause in the first place. Negative magic does not inevitably affect the target because that person's conscious or subconscious self protection, but negative magic inevitably affects the magician. Remember that this is the idea behind the symbolic resignation of Satanists selling their souls to the devil 
Negative use of the law is not necessary. Just think of all the bounty of blessing, healing, and love coming back. Hence, remember always to stipulate in all of your work for the good of all. By free will. Since positive magic is non-manipulative, it is important to include in your work according to free will or according to the free will of all. Such a statement will eliminate the possibility of even unintentional manipulative ideas entering the work, either manipulation of another person or of yourself. 6. Infinity By infinity, I mean the concept of non-limitation. I see two main obvious applications of this, and they are both infinitely comforting. A. Anything can be solved by working magic. There are no limitations on the potential applications of words of power. If you can just get yourself to the point where you can remember that no matter what problems seem to arise, they are potentially solvable within this frame of reference, then you have instantly eliminated being overwhelmed, in despair, or out of control. You just say, as weird, as terrifying, as confusing as this situation may seem to be, I will now handle it with words of power, my own use of positive magic. Then you automatically have the problem half solved. B. Always remember that no matter what the problem may be, there is an infinity of solution. If you've ever had that old familiar feeling of seeming to be in a double bind of having only choice one, two, or three, or whatever you, you can think of as solutions, and none of them feel completely comfortable, then you understand the saying, having to choose the lesser of two or three evils. Well, within the infinity of solution, there are a myriad infinite other solutions you might not yet have dreamed of. And they all fit with these principles. Notice for the good of all, for example, right from the start, you can work for a solution even if you haven't thought about it, about what specifically it is yet, which is totally for your good, with no pain, no compromise, and which hurts no one. In fact, which helps everyone. And it isn't necessarily choice one, two, or three. How will the solution come about? It will come most quickly if you allow yourself to believe that your subconscious mind will deliver the solution to you, i.e. the universe will deliver it to you through your subconscious mind. In cases like this, it is often best to leave it up to the goddess or the god or the power or your eternal soul or your subconscious mind, all being the same, to clarify this type of application using the infinity of solution. It helps to bear in mind. 7. The concept of form and essence. Even if you don't know exactly what you want, you know the feeling or essence of what you want. This feeling can be a key for you. You direct the work by specifying the essence and you allow the universe to pick the form. Remember, the world of form is more flexible than we may think. Forms come out of the invisible realm and manifest in the tangible world. Sometimes we know exactly what forms we need, but when working with the words of power, it's wise to stipulate always the effect need be limited to any particular form alone. It is always possible that something better might manifest, so be open to the flexibility of form, not for compromise, but for fulfillment. 8. Transformation Yes, change. That is the part that is the most dramatic, looks like a bona fide miracle. In the use of positive magic for self-help, no less important are the quiet miracles of turning negatives into positives or of establishing new causes and getting new effects. A problem may originally be seen as an effect of an older negative cause. When perception changes, the problem may be transformed into a positive cause for a new effect. Presto, change. And don't forget transformation of the self, the ultimate goal of positive magic. As you do the work, so you yourself change in positive ways. One might say the very act of viewing life in this way is a new starting point or causation for a more rewarding life. The shift of perception to anything is possible is a direct response to the concept of non-limitation. This becomes the first transformation. The work itself is transformation and the changed person living in this way is ever transforming himself or herself. Nine is love. This starts with self-love. Self-love is not to be confused with an ego trip which in my opinion is not self-love at all, but overcompensation for not loving oneself enough. A primary function of self-love is an unequivocal acceptance of the validity of getting what one wants, of respecting one's needs. It's an acceptance of the validity of getting what one wants, of respecting one's needs. 
It's an acceptance of the total responsibility for one's life, karma, and future. And the past as well. Love always includes responsibility. And after self-love is acknowledged, love for others flows more freely. 10. The Now Occult work is done in the present tense. Remember that we are working with the occult concept of simultaneous time, that all time is now, that all time, past, present, and future is happening at once. Remember that magic transcends our earthly linear sequential perception of time. It is helpful to keep in mind that the future is made up of all the nows. If you get the now in order, the future will follow accordingly. So when you use words of power, try to think in terms of the present tense rather than projecting into the future. All these principles work in harmony with one another in nature, in our work. We connect with the laws of nature on a deep level. One might say that our work is truly supernatural. It is not unnatural, but natural in the profoundest sense. Witchcraft is a nature religion. If we wish to draw upon its imagery, we may view ourselves as most effective in the workings of positive magic when we are at one with natural law. Instructions for composing words of power. Words of power work with a sequence of ideas which is stated according to the basic principles we have just delineated. Here is a simple example of a complete words of power statement. For purposes of this example, we will work for the goal of fulfillment. One, there is one power. Two, and this power is perfect fulfillment. Three, and I, and you insert your name here, and I am a perfect manifestation of this power. Four, therefore, perfect fulfillment is mine here and now. Five, for the good of all. Six, and according to free will. Seven, and so it must be. Instead of perfect fulfillment, we may have chosen to state perfect abundance, prosperity, love, health, harmony. Any specific quality or qualities, goal or goals we wish to experience. The use of the word perfect may be antithetical to the beliefs of some who feel that perfect represents a state unattainable by mortals. Semantics again. For those who cannot use perfect comfortably, let me qualify it by saying that perfect is used here in the personal sense, i.e. perfect for you, the worker, in harmony with the universe. If the word perfect still feels uncomfortable, then appropriate or right will do just fine. You may wish to make variations of your own. Any personal variations in style are appropriate, as long as you follow the basic structure of the words of power. Statement. This structure is one, an affirmation of the one, all-inclusive mind, life, power, energy, force. Two, a definition of the specific quality or goal for which you are working, defining it as an integral part of that one overall power. Three, an affirmation by name of yourself as a manifestation in microcosm of the overall power. Four, an affirmation of the quality goal which you have named as already existing within you. This quality is already yours by right of your consciousness, by means of the definition of yourself as part of the power. You, by definition, have all the attributes of the original power, because you are an individualization, a manifestation of it. Everything the power has, you have already. The words of power are a way of putting yourself more directly in touch with the power and in control of it. Five. The specific declaration that this work is for the good of all. 6. The statement that this work is according to free will. 7. An affirmation that you have concluded the work. Various, and so it is, or and so it is, and this is so, and so mote it be, be the traditional witchcraft phrase which literally means in older language, and so it must be. Incidentally, amen means the same. Just don't choose a concluding statement that implies doubt, such as, I hope it is so, or it is so. That's the whole idea. The words are the cause. They go out into the law of cause and effect. They come back. They manifest as the effect. Even though the words of power process may be thus described in this rational sequence, please bear in mind that it is based upon relational concepts. 
In this case, the effect is perfect fulfillment. If you wish to define the one power, the overall energy force, as God, of course you may do so. To many people, this idea defines God in any case. For step one, you may use the phrase, there is one God force, or there is one God power, or there is one God. This, however, is a matter of your own individual style. I personally have chosen to define the overall concept as the power, because when I think of God, I mean the masculine individualization of the power, and when I think of goddess, I mean the feminine individualization of the power. I refer to the power as all-inclusive, this in keeping with my own witchcraft beliefs. If you too feel an affinity for this tradition, you may use it. Basic words of power witchcraft style. 1. There is one power, which is goddess and god. 2. And which is perfect fulfillment. 3. And I, your name here, am goddess, or god, incarnate. 4. Therefore perfect fulfillment is mine here and now. 5. For the good of all. 6. According to the free will of all. 7. And so mote it be. If you prefer more contemporary variation, basic words of power scientific style, one, there is one creative life force in the universe, two, which includes perfect fulfillment, three, and I, your name here, hereby instruct my subconscious mind, four, to use this power to create my own perfect fulfillment, five, for the good of all, six, and according to free will, seven, I now release these words into the law of cause and effect working words of power in behalf of another person. To work words of power for another person, first, it is necessary to understand the concept of non-manipulation and of everyone's free will. And to have that person's permission, I recommend that you ask permission openly and honestly. If the person says to go for it, if the person asks you to work unsolicited, bear in mind the following concepts. We are all equal inheritors of the one power, you have no more power than anyone else, and the other person has no less. Our subconscious minds, or our souls, are all part of the same power. Therefore, even if you say the words, you are not really doing the work. You are helping the other person to do it for himself or herself. You are contacting the other person's subconscious in order to help point the way. It is the other person's subconscious that begins to do the work and makes it manifest. As Mel Brooks says, we are all singing. I have the mouth. So please understand that even if your mouth says the words, the other person is singing. In fact, the entire universe is singing. And it will not work if the other person does not want it to. Therefore, it is not up to you to decide what the other person needs or should have. So always ask first. Ask whether to initiate the work at all and ask the person what he or she wants. Then simply insert the other person's name in step three. Thus, to work for another person, words of power for another person. One, there is one power. Two, and this power is perfect fulfillment. Three, and other person's name is a perfect manifestation of this power. Four, therefore perfect fulfillment is his or hers here and now. Five, for the good of all. Six, and according to the free will and receptivity of all. Seven, and so it must be. Of course, you may use any style or variation on the basic statement. Note that when you are working for another person, step six is expanded and according to the free will and receptivity of all. Needless to say, when the results of the work manifest for the other person, do not expect praise. It's not appropriate motivation to work for another in order to prove what a wizard you are. Remember that traditionally no one claims credit for positive magic. The other person's subconscious mind worked at least as hard as you did in the unseen realm, and the entire universe joined in. Beware the ego trip. It is always important to be extremely careful of your intentions when you work words of power for another person. Do not force your work on another, ever. Do not coerce or argue or try to convince the person in any way. If the other person wants your help, he or she will tell you. And conversely, do not let another person talk you into doing the work if you do not feel like it. Non-manipulation is a primary facet of this work. Ultimately, of course, it would be best for everyone to work for himself or herself. The work one person does for another is what I call backup work, release of negatives. 
There is an optional step, which is recommended but not always necessary. This step is used when you specifically know of something, some negative quality or idea, which you wish to get rid of. For example, to return to our original words of power statement, when working for fulfillment as a goal, let us say we know exactly what the problem is that we wish to eliminate. Let us say that it is worry. Then we insert a statement that we are releasing the worry. Remember, when you release something, you are releasing the cause of the negative as well as the effect. We do not have to know consciously what caused the worry in the first place, but we have to acknowledge that something in the unseen realm must have caused the worry, remember the law of cause and effect, or it shouldn't be there. We would not want to release the worry and then be left with a headache or backache or any other negative effect in the place of worry. So insert a release statement releasing both cause and effect of the problem. And then we reaffirm the original goal. Always conclude the statement with a positive idea. One, there is one power. Two, and the power is perfect fulfillment. Three, and name is or am a perfect manifestation of the power. Four, therefore perfect fulfillment is mine, his or hers, here and now. I hereby release all negative causes, effects, manifestation, forms, and the essence of worry. Six, and perfect fulfillment is mine. Or you can say his or hers. Seven, for the good of all. Eight, according to the free will of all. Nine, and so it must be. Of course, you may release any negative alignment, symptom, discomfort, or problem in this way. Notice how you always follow the release of the negative with a restatement of the positive goal. Remember, as a general rule, when releasing a negative, never leave a gap. Always fill the space with the negative left when it exited. Fill that space with the positive you are working for. Most often, your goal will be the opposite of the negative you released. Notice, too, how I use words to qualify the negative on all sides. All causes, effects, manifestation, forms, and the essences of. I feel that negatives must be dealt with in very firm and in no uncertain terms. You may find it helpful to add when defining a negative. I release any channel within me which gave this negative cause power. I release any negative resignation to the problem and any unhealthy need to have this problem. Negatives may seem tricky at first. Notice how you feel after you say a word of power statement. Do you feel the slightest twinge of doubt or disbelief? If so, repeat your words of power and release any negative. I hereby release any distrust in this work. Any feelings of guilt over my own good results of my right to do this work. Any sense of limitation, doubt, fear, or disbelief in this work. Release anything that seems to be negatively holding you back. At first, this may seem paradoxical. For example, if you doubt the words of power will work in the first place, a common cultural problem for beginners, what good will it do to say that you release the doubt? Well, you might try saying the release in this way or at least understand the concept. Well, if my conscious mind seems to be having some trouble believing in these words of power, my subconscious mind knows that they are working. Another way to state the release is to say, I dissolve and release, state the negative. Some people can actually picture the release taking place in this way. Pain can dissolve, so can worry, fear, unhappiness, tension, anxiety, release, colds, coughs, etc. Acting in accordance. If words and conduct are not in accord and not consistent, they will have no effect. The I Ching Book 1 Hexagram 37 The use of words of power is not a passive technique. Yourself is what sets the words in motion, and it is your own responsibility to follow through. This does not mean thoughtlessly running around trying to solve a problem. It does not mean worrying over something to be rethinking it over and over. It means acting in accordance. It literally means behaving in harmony with the words you have put forth. For example, if you have said the words of power invoking perfect health, you may have set up a cause which will manifest as effect, the appropriate doctors, medicines, and treatments. Watch for the signs and be open to them. Acting in accordance works in this way. The words of power set up an alchemical process for you. Your own personal energy connects and merges with the universal energy forces. This creates a whole new vital flow of energy which is now yours. Another way of explaining this is that your own personal power plugs in 
with the infinite power and is thereby transformed into something new and special. When this occurs, this power, this new energy needs to become active. At this point, it is very important to let it work in the world of form. You simply go with it. You need not force yourself to act. If you're not ready, you're not ready. Also, sometimes acting in accordance simply means opening up to your good in new ways. But if and when you feel active, it is a natural process to simply let the action happen organically. This means creative action. Follow what feels right. It may seem the same as acting before you got into this work, but more likely it will feel different. You may even establish totally new patterns of action. You may be breaking old habits, but now you'll be acting in tune with your words of power. Remember that this form of magic works completely in accordance with natural laws. Consequently, the results often seem to happen naturally, so naturally in fact that some people do not even notice how one step leads to another. Then by the time the problem is entirely solved, the solution may seem like the most logical and unmiraculous occurrence in the world. And non-believers may scoff, your magic didn't heal you, Dr. So-and-so did, or that new miracle drug they just discovered is what did it. Well, fine. We're not aiming for applause or adulation. We are after results. It doesn't matter how results seem to manifest. It doesn't matter what form they take. The proof of the pudding is in the perfect deliciousness of the results. In my opinion, if you work words of power for perfect health, it doesn't matter whether the sick person leaps right out of bed instantly healed or whether the right doctor helps with the right diagnosis, the right treatment, and then the sick person recovers. What does matter is that the person is healed. The results of your work don't have to look dramatic. Sometimes they may look extremely dramatic, but that again is all a matter of style or form. Sometimes acting in accordance means some active physical participation on your part, looking for the right apartment, the right lover, etc. Sometimes acting in accordance means only being open to your own good when it comes to you. Sometimes it means watching for signs for manifestations. What acting in accordance does not mean is rethinking and reworrying the problem over and over, or doubting that your words of power are working. Acting in accordance means learning to trust in the effectiveness of your own power to direct your own life. Emotional atmosphere. Concentrate on the feeling you want. The emotional atmosphere may be the actual start of the work itself. Begin by focusing on the mood that you want to have as a reality after the work is accomplished. If your life is too hectic, you may concentrate on the mood of peace. If your life is too frustrated, you may concentrate on the mood of fulfillment. If your life is lonely, you may concentrate on the mood of what it would ideally feel like to love and be loved. Qualifiers, you may add the following phrases to your words of power statements according to your needs, with perfect ease, at the most perfect time, or with perfect timing, painlessly or with no pain, joyfully or happily. These qualifiers further provide the mood in which the work takes place. I suggest you insert a qualifier after you state for the good of all, or if you prefer, you may add it right before the concluding phrase, and so it must be. Applications. Words of power may be used for virtually any positive goal, healing, money, love, creative fulfillment, a job, an apartment, a house, a husband, a wife, a lover, good friends, a good night's sleep, a diet, a harmonious relationship. When working for relationships, no names are used, as is explained later. You may also use words of power for such conceptual goals as safety, protection, clarity, focus, inspiration, energy, wisdom, or self-realization. And words of power may be used to release any negative smoking habits, drug habits, insecurity, neurotic needs, phobias, fears, even evil spirits, which is the basis of exorcism. Just remember that when you release a negative quality out of your life, one, you are releasing both the cause and the effect of the negative quality. And two, you always replace the negative with a positive quality. And this is usually the direct opposite of the negative. For example, release insecurity, replace it with security. Release poverty and replace it with prosperity. Form and essence. When you work with words of power, you can use very specific means, set up specific causes and get back specific results and effects. That is why it is so important to think carefully before you actually begin to work for something. 
It might be helpful at first to write things down. I suggest a list of primary problems to be released and primary goals to be set in motion. I suggest two columns side by side, the release column and the goals column. Now you can see quite clearly what you want to get rid of and what you want to achieve. I suggest that you keep your goals rather broad at first. Begin by listing the qualities of life that you desire such as health, happiness, love, or prosperity. These are essences. The forms in which they will come have not yet been specified. Now determine any specific things that you want or need to make your life more comfortable or even bearable. These things might seem mundane, material, or practical, but do not judge them. Acknowledge them and put them in the goals column. Do not deny a need, however earthly it may be. Write down each one, a toaster oven, a car, a dishwasher, a color television, a new suit, whatever. These are forms. It is perfectly valid to work words of power for forms for specific objects to draw them into our lives however often we may see that several forms fall into a single category that of one essence for example such forms as the money for the rent the money for the telephone bill a new wardrobe and a trip to europe all fall into the essence category of abundance or prosperity if you work your words of power for the goal of prosperity or abundance you will receive all the money necessary to pay your bills and purchase what you need you may take care of this by working for the essence. You do not have to list all those other things, forms, because they would automatically be taken care of by achieving the overall essence first. Working for form. Perhaps you have the money you need to purchase something, but you want to make sure that you spend your money wisely. For example, say you want to buy a car, have saved for it, and now you want to make sure that you get the right one. But that you don't know much about cars, then it's not the essence, the money for which you work, your words of power. It's literally the form of the car itself. Even when working for a specific form, it is helpful to think about the category in terms of essence, under which you could classify that particular form. When my friend R phrased her words of power statement for a car, she asked herself, what do I need in terms of essence in order to draw into my life the right car for me? She decided that the form of the car would be considered a manifestation of two main essences, wisdom and abundance. She then phrased her work in this manner. There is one power, which is perfect abundance and wisdom. And I, a perfect manifestation of this power, hereby know my own abundance and wisdom. Specifically by drawing into my life and my possession the perfect car for me which fills all my needs and for the good of all according to free will and so it must be she then acted in accordance shopped around asked questions and found the perfect car for her a reasonably priced yellow vw car was used but in perfect working condition with a friendly owner who years later was still available for questioning and with a friendly garage where the repair people were familiar with that car once I didn't have the money for a particular item. I didn't work my words of power for the money. I worked for the form itself. What I needed was a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. It seemed as if all the money in the world wouldn't have helped me to pick out the right one or begin to know how to attach it to my wall. So I worked for the goal of the right reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder for my life according to free will and for the good of all. And I received one as a gift from my sister, who it turns out knows quite a bit about tape recorders then a close friend and engineer appeared and set it up for me. There is another example of working for a specific form. So there are many occasions when it is appropriate to work for forms. However, sometimes working for a form is a limitation. Remember the old adage, be careful what you wish for, it might come true. There is a whole body of folklore on this subject about people being granted magic wishes, having them come true, and then not liking what they got. These result from the misunderstandings of form and essence. If you wish to work specifically for a form, it's always best to add a qualifying phrase which releases any limitation of form. Thus, I would add to my statement for the tape recorder, I hereby draw into my life the right reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder for my needs, or its equivalent, or better. Working for essence. Examples of empty form fulfillment abound both in popular literature and in real life. 
the millionaire who makes all the money he wanted and then is unsatisfied because it did not buy him happiness or love. The glamorous movie star who wins fame and fortune but ends up lonely, exploited, misunderstood. You know all the old cliches. These are all examples of form fulfillment when essence fulfillment was the true need. How can you tell the difference? How do you know whether you want an essence or a form? First of all, ask yourself some essential questions. One, what is the feeling I want from achieving my goal? If your answer to this question is specific, then you know it is appropriate to work for a form. For example, if your goal was to have a toaster and the feeling you want from that is knowing you can make toast whenever you wish, then you can be fairly certain that you need a form. The same principle applies for a car, when you want to drive, a coat, when you want to be warm outside, a new stove, if your old one is broken and you want to cook, etc. But what if the answer to the first question was, I want security? or I want to be loved, or I want to feel contented, then ask yourself, two, can that same feeling come to me in any other way or ways than the specific goal I first thought I wanted? You do not have to be able to think of any other specific ways. Simply try to imagine if it is conceivable to have the same feeling from another form. Any other form, no matter how impossible it may seem. Remember the infinity of solution. If the feeling is your goal, then what you want is essence, and it can come to you in many ways. Further examples of questions you can ask yourself next, do I really want a million dollars or do I want the happiness I think it will bring? Do I really want a trip to Spain or do I want the perfect vacation for me? Do I really want a husband or do I want financial security or emotional security or just plain all-encompassing security? Do I really want a certain person to fall in love with me Or do I want the perfect relationship for my life? Do I really want to be a movie star? Or do I want creative fulfillment or recognition of my talents? Do I really want to be president of the company? Or do I want a feeling of self-importance? Remember, do not judge your goals. Sometimes a specific form is so socially acceptable that it might prevent us from acknowledging the true essence of our needs. And sometimes... We may have wanted to acknowledge an essence because we have judged its validity. But any need is valid, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone, as long as it is in keeping with all the principles, and any need may be fulfilled by your work once you have honestly acknowledged the need to yourself. It is perfectly acceptable to acknowledge that you want a feeling of emotional security, financial security, or a feeling of self-importance. These are all essences. When in doubt, remember the essence is that feeling, that quality which you think that a specific form will bring to you. Here are some examples of people who worked for Essence. A wants to release from his life the feeling that he never has enough money. He specifically chooses as his goal the sum of 35000 to see his family and himself through a certain period of time and to pay old debts. Then he stops and thinks, no, this is a form, what is the essence I really want? He then chooses and states the goal, the essence of financial security for myself and my loved ones. He includes in his words of power statement the release of any feeling of deprivation or insecurity. Soon the results of his work manifest in many ways. A raise of salary, then an opportunity to open a small part-time business of his own. The small part-time business grows into a large full-time business. And after two years' time, he has 65000 in his case, working for a specific form. A specific amount of money would have been a limitation. B was not happy in his job making sound recordings for commercials. He decided that he wanted to release from his life was the outer quality, the feeling of drudgery, and the lack of fulfillment. He thought at first what he wanted was a new job, but he thought, no, a new job is form. He liked his boss and his co-workers. He enjoyed working with film. He would in fact have liked to do more with film than merely recording sound, but he was not sure what form this might take. He worked his words of power for the essence goal of fulfillment in work, and soon he found himself branching out from sound recording to editing to directing. Although he remained with the same company and the same people, soon he was assigned complete creative control of some documentary films to be used for charitable institutions. B now feels creatively fulfilled and has also discovered that he enjoys directing film. He didn't literally get a new job, but now has a new role in his old job, and yes, 
he was surprised by the form in which its fulfillment came. B didn't know how much he would enjoy directing, or how good he would be at it. In this case, working for the essence delivered the side benefit of a new focus for his entire life and his future. A form new job might not have done that at all. E needed to make some changes in her life, made a list and saw that conditions looked quite complicated. She was a dance teacher with a new baby. E and her husband had been living in an apartment which doubled as a dance studio, but now the baby needed a room too. The apartment was too small. They didn't want to pay much more rent. She didn't want to leave the neighborhood where she had local students, and her husband found their home convenient for commuting. Should she phrase her words of power for the goal of a separate dance studio or a new place of work for her husband, or a full-time baby nurse, or the right daycare center, or a new group of students, or a job teaching dance somewhere else? Forms. The essence is E and her husband finally decided were the most appropriate living and working conditions for the whole family. They worked their words of power with this goal. The results were as complex as the needs and absolutely perfect for everyone. E and her husband found an apartment in the same neighborhood, reasonably priced, which had an extra living room and dining room. The landlord allowed them to break down a dividing wall, and E then had a perfect sized dance studio. The apartment had room for the baby plus an extra bedroom. The couple rented this out to a young woman student who gladly became the resident babysitter. E's students found the perfect location. E's husband still commuted with E's. The student had a friendly home. The baby had a new older sister. And the entire solution was resolved for the good of all. Who chooses the forms when you work for the essence? Your subconscious mind, also known as the universal power, the God, the goddess, the eternal souls of everyone involved. Remember the world of form is more flexible than we may think. We need to direct it how to move, inch by inch, in order for it to deliver into our lives that which we need. We need not allow it to seem to limit us. The world of form is as unlimited as the invisible realm. So we have seen that sometimes it is appropriate to work words of power for forms. And for that, sometimes working for forms is limiting, so we work for essence. Also, sometimes working for form is unethical and dangerous. This is when the form you want involves other people or even one other living being. Now it is time to emphasize two other principles, for the good of all and free will. Of course, all the work you do has the phrases for the good of all, and according to free will, built right into it. But let us examine more closely how this applies in two classic situations involving other people, a love relationship and a job situation. A love relationship. Unfortunately, most negative magic in this emotional area is based on two misconceptions. Harming the rival or manipulating the beloved by name. Neither of these dangerous practices will get you what you want. When you work with words of power, remember that you are setting up a cause. If you set up a cause of harm to anyone, for example, a rival of the loved one's affections, that harm can come back to you, and the universe will choose the form in which it comes back to you. It could come from anywhere, any area in your life. That is bad karma, to put it mildly. And as for manipulating the loved one, manipulation then becomes the cause. And by that old trustworthy law of cause and effect, that's just what comes back to you. The sender, manipulation, and again, the universe will choose the form, which can then come back to you, where and how you least expect it. No matter what pop witchcraft or magic spells you may have seen or heard about, and some of these may be quite imaginative, involving images, dolls, candles, string, photographs, articles of clothing. These are all dangerous. Avoid them with a 10-foot pole. Remember, control yourself using words of power to cause harm or to cause manipulation, which is actually a form of harm, is not only dangerous, it is not effective. Negative techniques work against the laws of nature. Of course, if you work words of power for the essence of love in your life, you are working with the laws of nature and not by specifying the form. The person you get the love which is right for you. But somehow in our culture, this very idea may be difficult to grasp emotionally. I think that this is partly because we are still influenced or conditioned by the medieval chivalry Hollywood love myth. Another way of saying this is that we have an Oedipal society fixated on the concept of one perfect male, unlike some more primitive cultures 
in which everybody loves everybody, or at least everybody knows he or she is potentially capable of loving everybody. In addition, we are also influenced, conditioned by a deceptive culture of winners or losers syndrome. I can't have what I want unless the other person loses out. Or conversely, if the other person gets Melba, I lose out. But remember all the principles. There is enough in the universe for everyone. There is an infinity of possible solutions. And yes, there is infinity of love. So the more love, the more consideration that goes into your words of power. The more love and consideration you get back. This does not mean sacrifice or compromise. Throw away any concept of manipulation. Throw away any concept of resignation. Compromise. Deprivation. And works for love for real love. You can have it. Work first. If you must, try to believe that it is possible. And finally, because this is such an important and potentially dangerous area, here is a pre-structured statement. A typical example of how to do this work. Of course, you may adapt the style, but be careful not to change the ideas. And remember, never mention another person's name. You are not working to get another person to love you. You are working to get yourself totally fulfilled in love. The focus is on you, not on another. This may be difficult to believe in the heat of passion, lust, fixation, frustration, romance, or any other state, which may be less than total clarity, but consider the side benefits. Not only are you going to have the perfect love relationship for you with no compromise, but you are also going to find yourself sane and open enough to enjoy the love relationship on a meaningful level. Words of power for a love relationship. There is one power which is perfect love. And I, your name here, a complete individualization of the power, hereby draw to myself the most appropriate, fulfilling, perfect love relationship, which is right for me. This takes place in a perfect exchange of love with the right person. And for the good of all, according to the free will of all, and so it must be, you might insert as a release, I hereby release all loneliness, despair, negative emotional patterns. If you have been truly fixated on a specific person, then be careful to insert a statement such as, I release all feelings of manipulations out of this work and out of my life. Another way of dealing with the ideas of free will and for the good of all, if you find yourself thinking, as alas, so many of us have done, that you couldn't be happy unless it was so and so, then think clearly to yourself before you start. The love relationship I'm going to work with these words of power for will give me as much happiness as or more than I've pictured coming through having so-and-so reciprocate my feelings. I suggest that you deal with this idea as the emotional atmosphere for setting up the work rather than risk the use of another person's name in the words of power themselves the use of a name until you are adept at this kind of work is dangerous you might let some manipulative thought leak in that could boomerang back on you simply understand as best you can that your own perfect love relationship will indeed be for the good of all it may very well turn out to be so and so but then you will know for sure that so-and-so chose you entirely out of his or her free will. But please understand that even if it turns out to be someone else, this does not mean that you have to compromise. Just keep on saying your words of power every day and act in accordance until you are totally, completely, perfectly satisfied in love. Any situation involving another person may come up against the same cultural winners-losers problem. Some examples if you are one of two or more people being considered for a certain job, if your team is playing another team, if your horse is racing another person's horse, if you're an actor up for a part, remember Rosemary's Baby? If you're the understudy to the star, remember All About Eve? If you want anyone to do anything for you, if you want anyone to do anything for anybody, if you want something for someone, if you want something to happen, which it seems someone can make happen, if you want your boss to give you a raise, if you want Santa Claus to give you a toy, it's the same thing. 
You cannot manipulate anyone and get away with it ever. You can ask for what you want clearly, openly, and honestly, either in a direct conversation, in a letter, or on the phone. But you cannot ethically or safely use words of power in the unseen realm for any purpose of manipulation at all. A job situation. This can often seem to be a competitive situation. Personally, I would not work the words of power for a specific job, even if I were being considered for one, because the, again, involves individuals. I would work for the essence of the right job, even preceding scheduled interview for a job I really want. The universal power will choose the form, i.e. the specific job. Think about what you would want from the ideal job. If you could have any job in the world, not what that job would be, but what are the feelings that I would like to get out of it? These will be the essences to work for. I personally would choose fulfillment, abundance, and security. Words of power for a job. There is one power, which is fulfillment, abundance, and security. And I am a perfect manifestation of this power. So I hereby draw to me fulfillment, abundance, and security in my life, specifically as the perfect job for me and for the good of all, according to the free will of all, and so it must be. Again, if you have a specific job in mind, think first as you are setting up the emotional atmosphere. The right job will come to me, which will give me at least as much, if not more, contentment, money, happiness, as I pictured coming through being Secretary of State or whatever. And if you find yourself thinking manipulatively about an individual, if only Mr. Big would hire me, or if only Jack Spratt would be fired, insert a release of this as a negative. I release all feelings of manipulation out of my life and out of these words of power. Remember, don't feel guilty either. You're not harming your competitor. This is for the good of all. And again, trust and believe that you won't have to compromise. Keep working the words and acting in accordance until the right situation manifests. You can see that when there's any doubt, keeping the concept of form and essence in mind, use your words of power, naming the essence. And if you're not sure what the essence of it is that you want, simply say, my subconscious mind knows what it is I need from the situation. My conscious mind will know at the right time and I draw it to me now, according to free will and for the good of all. The same principle applies when you are working for any exchange of services. If you wish to draw someone to you, whether it is for professional help, a doctor, a dentist, an astrologer, whatever, or for friendship, or even to create a study group or other organization, remember that there must be an equal exchange between you and the others. According to the needs of all and the free will of all, words of power for an exchange of services. This is one power, which is perfect, flow of energy and mutual help. And I, your name, a complete manifestation of this power, experience this perfect flow of energy and mutual help in perfectly appropriate equal exchange of services with the right person or people. Specifically, I draw to me, fill in doctor, astrologer, helpers, etc. for a relationship which is for good of all and according to everyone's free will and so it must be. Of course, act in accordance following this work. This does not necessarily mean that the first person you encounter will be the right one. Would it be very clear to you when you do find the appropriate person with whom to have this exchange. A big clue will be the revelation of the way you can fulfill the other's needs in ways you may not be aware of. When you're dealing with a complex situation involving large groups of people, divergent aims and morals, and when you don't have sufficient information about the issues, when you can't ethically in good conscience say what the outcome of a situation should be, then simply direct your words of power for the good of all. Work specifically for the good of all with, for example, politics, elections, wars, yes, even sporting events. Remember, there need be no winners or losers. The other people might not understand this yet, but you do. I further recommend that when involved with larger groups of people, you always add, this work applies to all who wish to participate 
according to their free will and receptivity. There will be a lot of beautiful fallout from working for the good of all. No matter what your preference is, no matter who you want to win the election, the battle, the race, try to work in such a way that nobody loses and everybody wins. If you can't do this yet, I advise you not to work with words of power for any group or competitive occasion. Manipulating a better side is dangerous and comes back, of course, on the worker as manipulation. When you work with these universal laws, you are tuning into universal harmony at the deepest, most creative, and most effective level, where there are no winners or losers. This may also be hard to believe or accept at first, in the context of a cultural step on the other person to get ahead atmosphere. Money and material abundance. Money has been such a misunderstood subject in our culture. Some people feel that it is immoral to use magic in order to materialize money in their lives. Such people seem to feel that it places them at an unfair advantage over others. On the opposite side of the spectrum are people who want to use magic or any form of affirmation mainly for material goods and seem to forget that money is simply a form manifestation of other invisible riches. I feel that both extremes are misunderstandings of the balance of resources in the universe. There are famous stories about Indian adepts who can materialize coins out of thin air. An interesting point to note is that usually these are people for whom money is practically meaningless. This trick is used as a demonstration of other principles such as the control we all have in potential over material possessions rather than their apparent control over us. In any case, I believe it is perfectly fine to work words of power for money. One, if you do not specify the amount, and two, if you work simply for the fulfillment of your needs, even if you are not yet consciously aware of what those needs are, but you know that you probably need a place to live and enough food or clothing to keep you healthy and warm. If there are others such as children who are financially dependent on you at this point, your words of power of work may include these fundamentals for them also. If you have any specific needs such as tools of your trade or any particularly meaningful material, objects, books, records, whatever, do not judge these as nasty materialistic desires. Your needs are valid as long as they do not deprive or harm any other being. When witches work magic for money, they often use the phrase just enough, meaning just enough to feel satisfied. Sometimes the forms they need come along in ways other than the money to purchase them. So when you work for money, be aware that your material abundance may also come as gifts, prizes, etc. Money after all is a form, abundance is an essence. As you work, try to be aware of any residual judgments or guilt feelings attached to your needs. Do you feel that you are taking money out of the hands of starving people? Do you feel that you are not worthy of being satisfied? Do you feel that money is a crass part of our culture? Also note, if you have any problems on the other side of the coin, so to speak, do you feel that you want to be incredibly rich? Do you feel that you must have some specific sum to feel secure? Do you believe that money will buy you happiness, power, or any other essence? In other words, watch out for any form contingencies and carefully release them. Remember that there is enough of everything in the universe for you to have your share. And what is your share? Just enough, as the witches say. Also, be on your guard for any negative causation such as feelings of deprivation or loss in other areas of your life, which may have been manifesting as not enough money for your needs. Be aware that when you are balanced out and feel fulfilled in every essence area of your life, money will automatically balance out for you and fulfill your needs also. Here is a words of power statement for abundance and fulfillment. You may also use the word prosperity. When I read this, I will not say your name after I, but you would, should say your name. Words of power for money and material abundance. There is one power, which is perfect abundance and fulfillment. And I am a perfect manifestation of this power, the power working for me and through me provides for me all the abundance and fulfillment which is rightfully mine. I draw to me and create in me all that I need in the world of form to fulfill my needs. 
This may come specifically in the form of money. I hereby release all cause, effect, manifestation, form, and essence, and any channel within me, which may have been preventing the appropriate flow of abundance in my life. I draw upon the balance of resources in the universe for the good of all, according to the free will of all, and I affirm my own wisdom in understanding my needs and how to fulfill them. I call to me just enough resources, knowing I deprive none, and am not deprived myself. I have just enough, and so must it be. Sometimes it all comes at once. Sometimes the abundance comes gradually. Very often, we must act in accordance. Acting in accordance often means mainly being open to accelerating gifts from the cosmos. These gifts, while fulfilling real needs, help us to adjust to the ideas of just enough. Not too much and not too little. For example, I know one witch who had never worked magic for money before. After her first self-blessing words of power statement for money, it took several months for the full abundance in her life to manifest. First, someone gave her $10 in exchange for a favor she had performed. The person was wealthy and insisted on this gesture. It meant no loss to him. Next, someone presented her with a dozen jars of pickled herring, her favorite delicacy. Next, someone provided free veterinary care for her cats. By now, she was becoming accustomed to the concept of what just enough meant in relation to her personal needs. Next, someone gave her an expensive quilt for her bed. Next, she got a raise at her job. By this point, she had just enough and has continued to experience her personally fulfilling abundance ever since. You may have to experience the results a few times, or maybe even more than once, to prove to yourself how exquisitely the universal harmony works when you are in tune with it, like the intricate workings of jeweled clockwork, makaru, or the word of truth. The superior man abides in his room. If his words are well spoken, he meets with a scent at a distance of more than a thousand miles. How much more them from nearby. If the superior man abides in his room and his words are not well spoken, he meets with contradiction at a distance of more than a thousand miles. How much more them from nearby? Words go forth from one's own person and exert their influence on men. Must one not then be cautious? The I Ching. The concept of Ma Karu or Mat was a highly regarded state being in ancient Egypt. In fact, it was always hoped that by the time a person died, he or she would have reached this state of personal evolution. The word itself is difficult to translate. Witches who trace their own traditions back to the early Egyptian mysteries still integrate the concepts of Ma Karu Mat or the world of truth into their work. Once one has attained Ma Karu, every word that is spoken literally comes true. This state is reached by speaking only those words which are true. The greater gods and goddesses were in this state, and you too may strive for it, as the witches do, in essence, for yourself. This state is attained by being very careful to say exactly only what one means. Consequently, idle chatter or lying serves only to dissipate the truth and the power. In our own lives, this means watch what you say, say what you mean, and mean what you say. You don't even have to use the specific technique of words of power to achieve makaru, for your words always speak truth and come true. But in my opinion, the principle of this important idea applies specifically to us today. If we are involved in the use of words of power in our daily lives, one might say that the use of words of power could conceivably get a person today to a state of makaru, where literally every word comes true. But even if this lofty ideal is not your immediate goal, please remember the principle behind it. That principle as I see it is that all words are incipient words of power. All words contribute to setting up causations and bringing back effects on the speaker or on the spoken about. Perhaps when one is just idly conversing, the effects are not as swift or obvious as when one has consciously worked a words of power statement. But the results eventually show up 
Also, if even part of the time you are involved in working actively with words of power, you are more consciously and directly plugged in with the law of cause and effect. Therefore, even at the times when you are not formulating specific word power statements, not thinking directly in the terms of this work, even when you are just chatting with your friends, your words still have power. This is not as overwhelming an idea as it first may sound. You do not have to automatically button your lip and make a vow of silence in order to avoid dire consequences. I simply recommend a series of helpful hints or guidelines which my friends and I have all learned and helped each other to remember. After a while, these guidelines become second nature or perhaps they were first nature to begin with. In any case, if you have friends who are interested in this work, you will find it easier to remember your own ma keru. If you all help by reminding each other, even if you are the only one on your block doing it, you will still be able to master these guidelines yourself. Then, not only will your words of power be more effective, you will also notice that the rest of your life will be more completely under your own control. Hints and Guidelines for Makaru 1. Notice with a sense of personal responsibility what you are saying. Specifically, watch yourself for negative statements such as, I'm dropping dead, I'm crazy, I'm sick, I'm tired, I'm fed up, I give up, I'm a nervous wreck. These are self-directed energies. Now watch and see whether you've ever, in moments of rage, frustration, worry, or other valid emotions pronounced about other people that he, she, they is, are no good, crazy, stupid, sick, moronic, heading for a fall, looking for trouble, going to get hurt. These are other directed energies. The use of negative pronouncements, whether directed towards the self or towards another, is a minor form of cursing. It is indeed the setting up by means of work of negative causes, by the law of cause and effect, they can automatically come back to the speaker. Negative statements cloud and dissipate the work of words of power, and in the lives of people who do not consciously use words of power, such negative words can unconsciously continue to set up causes which come back by the law of cause and effect. Any negative statement is a spoken subconscious directive. Remember, negative statements can harm not only the person who is spoken about, they always potentially harm the speaker everything comes back. 2. Learn to modify your statements. Once you're used to watching for negative remarks, you'll find it's easier than you think to change your phrasing almost immediately. I'm not advocating an everything is wonderful approach. I feel this is often not appropriate. Why deny real negative feelings if you're actually experiencing them? Of course, these feelings will be changed. That's the purpose of this work. But meanwhile, why grin and bear it? So modify those negative statements that just seem to pop right out and thereby remove any power from them which could set up negative causes. Instead, make modified statements such as, I feel as if, or it appears to be, it feels like, it seems to me that, in my opinion. Learn to express yourself in this way with no harsh pronouncements. It is also helpful to state negatives, if you must, in the past tense. I was discouraged, I was unhappy, there were problems. The most powerful way to literally strip a negative statement of all bad powers to say out loud or quietly inside yourself, I take it out of the law, or I don't put this into the law, meaning the law of cause and effect. You say this immediately after you say a negative statement or before. If you can catch yourself in time, you can also say this after you hear another person pronouncing a negative statement. If it is a person who understands the work, you may of course say this out loud. It is someone who wouldn't know what you were talking about to save embarrassment or lengthy explanations. You may simply silently think it. Taking a negative statement out of the law in this way immediately prevents it from causing a negative effect. If, of course, it is according to free will and for the good of all that the negative effect be prevented. My friends and I spent years overcoming our respective negative speech habits of the past. We agreed to remind each other consistently in abbreviated form, take that out. For examples of mastering one's own makeru, what a terrible day, everything's going wrong. Take that out of the law and now just watch the day get better. Or in an argument, you're full of hot air. I take that out of the law. Well, er, um, it seems to me that you might be full of hot air. Note how this takes the stream out of the argument. Or some true examples, I blush to admit that I use to refer playfully to my dog as a little flea bag. And soon not only did my dog get fleas, but so did my entire apartment. 
I took that out of the law pretty fast and worked the right words of power, releasing fleas, and sped over to the vet. Courting in accordance, drew into our lives the world's fastest acting flea powder, and have never insulted my dog since. This was dramatically literal example cited for purposes of illustration. There are possible less literal effects of the careless use of words. Whenever I hear a gloom and doom character on the radio or television predicting terrible things for anyone or anything, I take it out of the law. Radio voice. The United States is turning into a military fascistic demagoguery. Me. I take that out of the law. Of course, you have to consider the other person's free will. No manipulation, remember, even with Makaru. For example, recently I overheard a woman in a restaurant. I'm so sick my doctor is no help at all. I just get infection after infection. My blood is no good. My hormones aren't working. The woman appeared to be in perfect health. I know that many hypochondriacs can quite effectively create illnesses by setting a stream of negative causes like this. Eventually, the effect can manifest as actual disease, but did I take it upon myself to prevent this? No. I mumbled into my scrambled eggs. That doesn't go into the law unless she wants it to, according to her own free will and receptivity. When in doubt, when things look complicated, better not interfere. Take your own negative statements out of the law. Take the negative statements of others out of the law when they are directed either at you or viciously at someone else. Gossip columns. Lorna Lovely is working herself into an early grave. Me, I take that out of the law. But don't interfere if it is obviously someone else's karma as difficult as that may be for you. For example, person at a party. This party stinks. I hate parties. I can't dance. This is none of my business and none of yours. Leave the person to his or her own cause and effects, knowing that you may remain untouched. As for the borderline cases, invoke for the good of all and according to the free will and receptivity of all just as in using words of power for example clergyman in a tv sermonette and so mankind is doomed to suffering and travail me i take that out of the law for myself and according to free will for the good of all those who want to participate in suffering and travail should be free to do so those who wish to omit these aspects from their lives may participate in taking it out of the law according to their free will and receptivity what about lying please try not to what about those kind of little white lies this is really up to your own conscious but always take all the negativity out of a lie of the law or it can perpetuate and come back as some form of dishonesty in your own life an added tip to actors singers typists writers or anyone in a position to quote a negative statement in the line of work, yes, take it out of the law according to the guidelines above. Singer aloud, you've got me in between the devil and the deep blue sea. Silently, I take this out of the law. Actor, before going on stage as Hamlet, I do not put any negativity into the law. Some actor, ah, that this too solid flesh would melt. Comedian, take my wife, please, wife. I take that out of the law. Technically, Ma Kiru fits in with the concept of acting in accordance. And need I add, never, never undo your words of power by saying anything afterwards which denies their effectiveness, such as, I don't really believe in that nonsense, or the more subtle, gee, I wonder if this stuff really works. Also, don't perpetuate a problem by repeating it over and over after you have said your words of power. Let the words go out into the law. Release your doubt as best you can and trust in the law's good workings and the positive power of your work. Finally, remember that the reverse of negative words is positive words. Any words of kindness, of love, encouragement, and caring amount to blessings. These are good to put into the law when you mean them, even in daily speech. You look terrific. I really feel good today. I want to remember this wonderful moment. Good doggy. I really want to understand you, and positive words will come back to you. Things look swell. Things look great. Gonna have the whole world on a plate, starting here, starting now. Honey, everything's coming up roses. Grab your coat. Don't forget your hat. Leave your worries on the doorstep. Just direct your feet to the sunny side of the street. Lyrics like these may go into the law as essence. Additional ideas for using words of power for self-blessing and the blessing of others.
Essentially, one statement of words of power is enough to create a new cause and effect manifestation for each situation you wish to work on. Most people find it easier to work by saying the statement once a day or a few times a week. It may be repeated until the results manifest. More often than once a day may connote doubt which can slow down the manifestations. The statement may be said aloud or it may be thought in silence. The statement may seem to need changes or revisions over a period of time and if so, change it accordingly until your inner bell is satisfied. Backup work, it can be helpful to enlist the support of another person who may state words of power for you only. If you can truly accept the idea that you don't need that other person or other people's help, please understand that even if you were on a desert island working all alone, your work would be just as effective as if an entire coven of experts were all blessings along with you. It may be comforting to know that another person is working along with you, it may even speed up the manifestations, because often another person has an objectivity which you yourself may not consciously perceive when in the midst of a problem. But remember that you are always the one who is doing the work for yourself, and nobody can do it better than you, instead of you, or for you. Ideally, this is a comfortable and energizing. So, if you perceive any discomfort when working with words of power, first of all, try to identify the discomfort. Then you may label it as a quality to be released. Example, doubt or worry might pop in your thoughts as you work and be perceived as a source of fatigue. If you're suppressing or working against these feelings without acknowledging them, so you state, I hereby release all doubt or worry from this work. Two, you may simply solve the problem of fatigue by adding the qualifier with ease. This serves to negate any misconceptions about words of power being difficult to do. Three, if you have tried either or both of those above suggestions and still perceive any feelings of hard work, fatigue, or discomfort of any kind surrounding the work, perhaps you ought to re-examine your goals, stop the work for a while, and think about what you really want. If you feel too confused, too upset to know what exactly what goals to work your words of power for, work in stages. Try any or all of these methods. 1. Work with words of power specifically for an atmosphere of calm, clarity, and comfort. 2. Release any negative quality you perceive in yourself, confusion, depression, whatever, and replace it with an affirmation of its opposite, clarity, happiness. You will find that being able to define the negatives and the positive surrounding your problem is a big step towards being able to clarify the problem itself and consequently release it. How long does it take for words of power to manifest? It could take a split second, it could take years, or any time in between. It often can be a limitation to stipulate any specific time period in your work, however compelling such an idea may seem. In fact, the idea that this problem must be solved by such and such a date may in itself be a problem. Remember, sequential time is a limiting perception, so if you are concerned about timing, state as a release, I release any worry or concern about timing, and or insert as a qualifying phrase, this work manifests at the perfect or most appropriate time. Perfect timing does not mean frustration in waiting, compromise, or rationalization. This manifestation comes when we are organically ready for it. It may come in stages. If there is a significant delay, it may be an indication that a more important problem or limiting idea may need work first. If so, work for the goal of wisdom and understanding of my needs. The important point to understand is that once you have said these words of power are working in the invisible world, even before they manifest in the world of form. Advanced Work Problem Solving with Words of Power when a problem seems overwhelming, that usually means that you have been giving it a great deal of power in your life. But this is not necessarily a negative phenomenon, as long as you do not try to ignore or avoid the problem. It can be your subconscious mind's way of telling you that you are now ready to look at something important that you might not have been able to see before, and the time has come to see the problem because you are now ready to deal with it and equipped to solve it. Most of us have some negative tendencies, habits, patterns, which might have been operating as causes on a deep subconscious level, creating negative effects in our lives. When we understand the principles of karma and the work of words of power, we are then equipped to deal with problems on these deep levels 
and literally to change our karma in huge ways. Some problems which might ordinarily have taken years of this lifetime to work out can be dealt with through reasonable karmic understanding and careful word of power work, and the process can become a remarkably short one. Some problems which might even take several lifetimes to work through can also be solved with this same approach within a short period of time and within this one lifetime. 1. Tracking down causations. If you wish to work in a sequential linear step-by-step -step way, you can attempt to trace the problem back to its original causation or cause. Sometimes simply being aware of the cause is enough to automatically solve the problem. Sometimes it is necessary to work words of power to change the cause as well as the effect. Please remember that within the view of all problems may be seen as effects of some personal causes for which you are somehow responsible. 2. Accepting responsibility. The first step to accept responsibility for the causation, even if you do not yet know what the causation actually has been, if the person has been manifested in your life, then it is your causation no matter how things appear to be. It is vital to accept responsibility for the causation up front because this is a first step towards acknowledging your ability to change it. Often deep problems have been caused subconsciously, but this does not mean you are exempt from responsibility. Karmically speaking, you are responsible for your subconscious as well as your conscious activity. Now, it may be temptation at first to attach some form of self-judgment, blame, guilt, or anger to the act of accepting responsibility. In fact, in some cases, this erroneous idea can be the problem. That is the problem can simply be having been unable to accept responsibility for something because it is too painful to live with the self-abasing feelings which may seem to be part of accepting responsibility especially accepting responsibility for some past mistake accepting responsibility is a simple act no self-judgment no guilt no blame no anything goes along with it try to get into the habit of accepting responsibility for the causations in your life even in the abstract sense, in a pure and simple way. This does not, however, mean accepting responsibility for other people's lives, just yours. If another person is involved in the problem, you accept your part of the responsibility and leave the rest up to the other person's free will. It is entirely up to the other whether or not he or she wishes to work with the problem in this way. If you solve your part, you will have solved the problem for yourself. If you have equated accepting responsibility with self-judgment, this could have made it too awful a process to deal with. Consequently, you might have developed a habit of blaming others, feeling helpless, blaming fate, and generally not feeling to control of your own life. Things may seem to happen from outside the self, but this entire attitude can be a causation for new problems. Such a causation can be solved by working words of power for the goal of complete acceptance of my own responsibility for my own life, without any blame, guilt, anger, or judgment. Only when we realize that our mistakes are of our own making will such disagreeable experiences free us from errors. The I Ching Book 1 Hexagram 60 3. Negative Perceptions Sometimes the problem can be obscured by one's perception of it. In fact, sometimes in the process of negative perception in itself can be the problem. A problem is one thing, but how you perceive it can vary in myriad ways. The most common form of negative perception is allowing a problem to seem so important that it blocks out all other aspects of one's life. For example, an ancient Greek legend tells of talented poetess who threw herself off a cliff because her lover had rejected her. In other areas of her life, she was creatively fulfilled, successful, and much appreciated. She had lost perspective on every positive area of her life by concentrating on giving too much power to the pain she perceived as rejection. There are many possible explanations for losing perspective, having to do with early childhood experiences in this life, or even experiences in other lifetimes. If you perceive any problem with an appropriate perspective, such perception could be more of a problem than the alleged original problem which triggered the response. In occult terms, the negative perception could become a negative causation for future negative effects, experiences in one's life, creating a chain of negative cause and effect. I'm not recommending repressions of emotions. I'm recommending that one's perception of a problem be appropriate to the role of the problem in one's life. Watch out for any tendency to allow the perceptions of another person to color your own perceptions. 
For example, if my friend believes that the worst fate in the whole world is to live alone, this does not necessarily have to be true to me. Even if she thinks it is true for me, it is simply her perception. The same principle applies to the area of perception of another person's karmic choice. If another person chooses, and in occult terms, these are all karmic choices to leave you, to become sick, to leave the earth plane, to do anything which you perceive as painful for you, it is valued for you to experience the pain up to a point. Beyond that point, it can become an unwillingness on your part to accept the other's free will. I'm not advocating selfishness, heartlessness, coldness, or the denial of genuine emotional responses. I am suggesting that another person's karmic choice be seen within the context of the other person's life more appropriately than solely within the context of your own life. In any case, if you catch yourself experiencing a problem with a perception which seems to fill your horizons with pain, despair, worry, or suffering, stop and ask yourself, is this problem as bad as it seems? Or is my perception of it worse than the problem itself? If the answer appears to be that your perception is inappropriate, say the words of power for the goal of correcting your perceptions first. For example, even though this problem may seem to fill my horizons, this is only because I have perceived it in this way. I now perceive it in a perfect, appropriate perspective for my own life as a problem which I can solve. After you have taken care of the perception aspects of the problem, you may direct your words of power with more objectivity directly to the goal of solving the original problem itself, whatever that may be, if there still is a problem left to solve. Four, direct causations. Sometimes we have directly and completely created problems for ourselves, albeit subconsciously. This is often easier to spot for other people. He or she is asking for trouble and sometimes difficult to spot for ourselves, even after the fact. Whatever your problem is, ask yourself, in what way could I conceivably have created this problem? If you have directly created a problem, this question is usually not too difficult to answer if you approach it objectively. For example, if you leave the water running in your sink while you go off on a vacation and come back to find a flooded floor, there is a problem that you have directly created. However, it may not always be that clear. So next, ask yourself, in what way could I have drawn this problem to me? Often we can draw a problem into our lives by creating a negative emotional atmosphere, which is literally a breeding ground for such a problem. For example, if a person has been emotionally experiencing a feeling of loss in her life, often unacknowledged or not appropriately acknowledged, this can create an emotional atmosphere which can manifest symbolically in tangible ways. The person may literally lose a material possession or even be robbed. If a person feels vulnerable, and this vulnerability needs appropriate acknowledgement, he or she thereby created an atmosphere in which she becomes or he becomes victimized in some way or even directly attacked. If a person feels guilty about something and has not appropriately dealt with this guilt, he or she might draw into his or her life some punishment which at first glance may seem unrelated to the source of guilt. In general, if one has created a negative emotional atmosphere through which a f new problem has manifested as an effect, it is important to acknowledge the existence of the negative emotional atmosphere and to investigate its cause. In the above cases, the person who may have lost something or been robbed should figure out why he or she felt the emotional sense of loss and deal with that and do words of power in that area. The person who became victimized should figure out why he or she felt vulnerable in the first place and reaffirm his or her own personal power. And the person who felt guilty should figure out where the guilt came from and release the guilt. In all cases, one solves the problem by tracking down the emotional atmosphere rather than being deflected by the forms in which the effects seem to come, often out of the blue. In all cases, one may work words of power on both the causes, including the emotional atmosphere, and the causes behind that, and the effects. 5. Participation When a problem involves more than one person, it may appear as if someone else caused the problem and you become an innocent victim. In such a case, you may now see that you participated by allowing yourself to take on the victim role. Silent suffering is just as much participation as noisy fighting. 
It is not always so clear cut, but in general problems of participation are usually the result of misunderstanding of one's personal power in relation to other people's power. The key is that everyone has equal power. If you view another person as having authority over your life and free will in any way, if you feel threatened, afraid, or subservient, then you're giving the other person too much power. If you take advantage of someone in any way, if you bully the other person, feel condescending, pitying, or believe that you must do something for the other's own good, then you are giving yourself too much power in relation to the other. Giving another too much power or taking too much power yourself are both sides of the same coin, misunderstanding personal power. The tyranny of the weak is the term applied to a whole list of manipulative behaviors which a person can employ to get power over another person. People who try to make others feel guilty, who act manipulatively, who assume the victim role to make the other look like a villain, are actually trying to exercise extra power by the technique of appearing to possess less power themselves. Conversely, if you feel sorry for someone, if you view the other in a subservient role and then condescend, you can be in effect saying, I feel threatened by the other person's apparent power, so I will manipulate the situation to make it look as if I am stronger. This can become quite complex and get into all sorts of games. It takes two to tango, as the old song goes. If you're experiencing problems in relation to anyone, for any group, ask yourself, in what way could I have participated in the problem? Again, you accept responsibility for your own role only and do not dwell on others' responsibilities. Leave it up to free will, of course. If it is someone you can talk to openly, you might explain these principles. Many relationships can be helped in this way and then leave it up to the other, whether or not he or she wishes to work in that way. If you discover that you do have problems in this area, work words of power to release your own negative participation, causes and effects, and work towards the goal of your positive participation in all future interactions. I also recommend that you work for this goal perfect, appropriate understanding and expression of my own personal power. 6. Perpetuation and Negative Resignation These two attitudes usually go hand in hand and may be conscious or subconscious. Perpetuating a problem is literally keeping it going. Whether or not the problem was originally of your own making within this lifetime, if you continue to live with that problem, you are responsible for perpetuating its existence in your life up to this point. For example, if a person entered into a relationship a long time ago, and if over the years the partners grew away from each other until the relationship became a negative situation, if all attempts repairing and restructuring the relationship have been unsuccessful, then the seemingly passive act of simply staying within that relationship probably is perpetuating the problem. Sometimes perpetuating a problem can be disguised to look as if one is dealing with it or sticking with it. But dealing with or sticking with a situation is a constructive act, which becomes evident when they are positive results. On the other hand, perpetuating a problem is demonstrably non-productive. Thus, in fact, it becomes self-destructive. Sometimes perpetuating a problem is a subconscious activity. Sometimes perpetuating a problem comes from not recognizing or acknowledging that there even is a problem. Another way one can perpetuate a problem is by ignoring the principles of other people's free will and their karmic right to remain unchanged. For example, there are people who may claim that if only so-and-so would behave differently, I would be happy. It is not necessary for one to have created a problem in order to accept responsibility for it, but one makes the problem one's own by perpetuating one's existence within it. Negative resignation to a problem may manifest generally as a vague feeling of helplessness, hopelessness, or inertia, or having already given up. Or negative resignation may manifest specifically in thoughts such as, why bother? What's the use? There's nothing I can do about it anyway. Thus, it is a manifestation of conscious or subconscious feelings of lack of one's own personal power. Often, an attitude of negative resignation presupposes one's inevitable future to achieve one's goals. One may feel negatively resigned to the few limited alternatives which one perceives as being the only available solutions. This is in effect a total lack of awareness of the occult principles of the myriad other alternatives which can become possible and potential once you acknowledge and activate your personal power. In any case, perpetuation of a problem and negative resignation to a problem may be corrected by concentrating back on the self and on one's own personal power and ability to cause change in one's own life. 
no matter what anyone else seemed to be doing, saying or decreeing, the thing to do is ask yourself, am I perpetuating a problem? And if you have been doing so, accept the responsibility. Some problems literally disappear when you stop perpetuating them. Others are considerably diminished and more easily solved if the pattern solutions seem impossible, if the odds seem against you. Carefully structure your words of power statement towards these goals. A. To acknowledge your own power. B. To find your own center and inner bell. C. To achieve the essence of the fulfillment of your needs. And D. Draw upon the infinity of solutions as suggested in form contingencies below. Of course, state in the release section that you do not perpetuate the problem any longer, nor do you perpetuate any other problems. If it seems applicable, release all negative resignation as well. 7. Form Contingencies A form contingency is a limiting idea usually manifest in a form, which seems somehow connected to another idea, seems to be a part of the package. Usually a form contingency seems directly linked to or even a part of a positive idea, a goal, or something you want. Often the culture supports popular form contingencies, which may then seem to be facts of life. If you have or are this, then you can't have or be that. In the past, most people buckled under an accepted form contingencies, but lately people are realizing that they do not need to accept them. Actual form contingencies need not be accepted by anyone, whether the forms are culturally enforced, decreed by some authority, or privately deduced. A form contingency is always an illusion and a limiting one at that. One of the main problems with this phenomenon is that if you believe in a form contingency deeply enough, often subconsciously and unnoticed, you can continue to draw yourself evidence of its seeming validity by means of cause and effect, the cause being your own belief in it. Be especially watchful for form contingencies lurking within the goal of a words of power statement, because they can build in a negative situation or perpetuate one rightly along with the achievement of your positive goal. Form contingencies can lurk in the most surprising places. The key for discovering them is to notice any limitation or even any feeling of limitation. In general, a form contingency may be seen as some form of manifestation, of negative resignation. A form contingency says you have to compromise. You can't have everything. So, if I do this, I can't do that. If I have this, I can't have that. If I get this, the positive thing, it means that the negative thing must inevitably come along with it. Thus, you can see that if you inadvertently build a form contingency into the process of solving some problems, you can thereby create a new problem by building its causation right into your solution for the old problem. The solution for dealing with form contingencies is simple. Remember the infinity of solutions. And remember that given essence may be fulfilled in myriad forms. If you have noticed any error of negative association or limitation when doing a words of power statement, state in your release, I release all form contingencies and I replace with them the infinity of solution and with perfect fulfillment of essence. If you discover a specific form contingency, of course, you may name it specifically as you release it and you may categorically release all form contingencies within your words of power work as preventative medicine. And of course, remember, Ma Keru, if anyone tries to apply a form contingency to you, take it out of the law. 8. Indirect causations. Therefore, it is important to begin at home to be on guard in our own person against the faults we have branded. The I Ching Book 1 Hexagram 43. If you've taken care of all areas of personal responsibility and if a problem still persists in your life, then you're probably dealing with an indirect causation. If something seems to happen to you in any area of your life, and none of the above methods for discovering direct causation seems to apply, here is a way to track down indirect causes. Ask yourself, what is the quality of this negative event or problem? Once you've answered that, then ask, have I enacted the same quality in any other area of my life, either towards another person or towards myself? This may take some thinking at first, but after a while, it becomes obvious and easy. Here's a true example. F was crossing the street when a car suddenly swerved, the driver angrily yelling at F almost hit her. She thought, what did I do to draw that to me? She searched, 
She hadn't created it. She wasn't looking for any angry accident. She had not created an emotional atmosphere for abuse. She was not negatively resigned to it. She was not participating in it in any way. In other words, she honestly ruled out all the above causations. But she knew that something coming from her own consciousness was trying to give her a message by means of this near accident. Then F asked herself what the quality was and the answer was clear anger. Now she asked where she had been feeling angry either towards someone else or towards herself and she found the causation here that morning F had been furious at her boyfriend. She had also been angry at herself for allowing him to borrow something she had not yet returned. F had earlier that day already acknowledged her participation in the interaction with her boyfriend but instead of simply acknowledging F had attached blame and anger to the acknowledgement directed both towards herself and towards him. Since she hadn't solved this emotional atmosphere of anger, she literally drew a stranger's anger toward her in a dramatic and at first glance unrelated episode to point out to herself that there was an important emotional area in her life that needed fixing. According to the law of cause and effect, the quality of her own anger had come back to her indirectly. First, F accepted responsibility for her participation in, in drawing near accident with no blame. Then, she accepted responsibility for her own anger towards herself and towards her boyfriend, no blame. Finally, she worked a word of power statement to release anger and replace it with creative energy and self-determination. Thus, this was an indirect causation, which was just as important as a direct causation and just as helpful for indicating an important solution. 9. Balancing the dark and the light. As we have seen in other chapters, which is acknowledge both the dark and light aspects of all life. Neither dark nor light is to be ignored. Neither dark nor light is to be given too much power. There is no judgment on either dark or light, even though it is in keeping with the witch philosophy to work towards the light as a choice in magic and in life. This is the essence of positive magic. In general, one may apply witchcraft philosophy to problem solving in this way. Problems may be seen as manifestations of the dark while we experience them, while they are giving us discomfort or pain as long as these problems remain unsolved, they remain dark negative aspects of our lives. But our own personal power and energy aligned with all the positive and light forces of the cosmos can transform these manifestations into light and positive aspects of our lives. This, of course, is the goal in problem solving just as nature, every dark aspect in each of our lives, has the potential to return to light. All the above causations for problems, both direct and indirect, are solved by acknowledging the dark without judgment. This is the first step towards transforming it to light. This may be a delicate process. A problem can seem overwhelming and even insoluble if one overemphasizes its darker negative aspects and gives the problem and consequently the dark too much power. But neither is the light to be overemphasized or given too much power either. This can be the other extreme, ignoring the dark entirely, refusing to see it, or to acknowledge its existence specifically, refusing to acknowledge the dark within oneself. This can occur for many reasons. We have just seen in the above process of tracking down causations. Most often people may not be aware that they have any recourse to solving their problems by way of the occult principles, not aware that they have a personal power to exercise for good, nor aware that the process of acknowledgement can be a non-judgmental, neutral, and effective step. Once people learn about the acknowledgement process, once they learn that they can work in a positive way, then they are able to accept responsibility for their own karma, then problem solving can become a clear process. But there are some people who may still feel the dark is somehow bad. And if they acknowledge its existence within them, even as potential, they may think that they are somehow bad. Hence, they may not be able to see anything negative, even if it is most obviously manifesting in their lives. Because of our Piscean Age cultural heritage, there may be times when any of us might slip into this pattern. We may judge not only ourselves as bad, if we perceive error or negative behavior, but also judge dark or negative aspects anywhere in life as bad. Death is bad. Illness is bad. Weakness is bad. Old age is bad. Anger, anxiety, worry, fear, insecurity, mistakes, all these 
and many other common occurrences may seem bad, but this is like saying the moon is bad. When it wanes to crescent form or that the sun is bad on a cloudy day, there is no judgment on the dark. It exists in potential in every life form, and without the dark there could be no light. And furthermore, if one ignores the dark completely, it can literally take over. Well, few people resort to blaming all their problems on the devil or evil spirits these days, fortunately for us witches. But there are still people who may project their own negative aspects onto others. This can happen between individuals. It's all your fault. Or between nations. Wipe out the enemy. Or in social groups. There goes the neighborhood. Then too, there are people who may simply lapse into some form of escapism. Drugs, drink, overwhelming immersion in work or in the problems of others. Anything to avoid facing the dark within. There are even people who may force themselves to keep smiling and saying how wonderful everything is even in the face of some obvious pain. At certain times, any one of us could act in this way, but ignoring pain is not a solution. The first step towards releasing pain is to recognize it, Spirit K. If the dark is ignored for too long, if problems within are denied, they may cry out to be heard and solved, as various negative manifestations may develop in a person's life. Today, many of these manifestations are recognized as danger signals by the medical and psychiatric professions, so there is no need to discuss stress-related illness, depression, anxiety, psychosis, or neurosis here. There are numerous authorities today who are excellently equipped to deal on this level, but there are still some manifestations which in occult terms are specifically related to ignored pain, to ignored problems, to ignored aspects of the dark within. Some of these manifestations may not seem to be directly related to anything in particular, but within the occult frame of reference, we can trace the causations clearly and thus solve many a mysterious problem or event. 10. The New Causation We have seen how helpful it can be to track down the original negative cause of a problem, but it's not always necessary to do so in order to affect the appropriate solution. If none of the above methods has revealed a specific negative cause for you, you may say words of power statement for the goal of perfect revelation of the cause of this problem according to free will and for the good of all. Now, if the cause still does not reveal itself to your conscious mind, it may not be right for you to know the cause at this time, but you can solve the problem. The important thing is that there could be a negative cause and the problem has become a negative effect of it. It also is important to bear in mind that if the problem has been left unacknowledged or if any reason it continues to remain unsolved, the problem itself can then become a cause for further negative effects and consequently further problems. This process may go on and on in linear time perception. A chain of conditioning can thus be set up in a person's life which can reinforce the seeming reality of the original problem. But words of power can intercede to transform the moment in which an effect is about to become a new cause. This moment of transformation changes the heretofore negative effect into a positive cause instead of a negative one. This transformation may also be accomplished simply by a swift shift of perception, a sudden deep awareness that anything is possible. It can be brought about by a long and specific words of power statement, or it can be brought about by a short words of power statement, which is based upon an understanding of the principles and ideas delineated thus far. That is, if you know that you are responsible, no blame, for the cause, and you know that you are consequently responsible for and perfectly capable of causing change, then you merely acknowledge this new moment as the beginning of the new causation. This means that you are now setting up a new chain of cause and effect, this time a positive one. You may simply state the new causation somehow turns this entire situation around for the good of all and according to free will. You may do this if a situation seems complicated, if you're in a hurry, or if you have not been able to track down the original negative cause. As you do this, of course, you are aware that the infinity of solution may now reveal you entirely new and unthought of solutions. After a while, you may acknowledge that this process, the new causation, is actually always operating in your life, even on a subconscious level. In other words, you may put the new causation on automatic pilot. Words of power for setting up the new causation in your subconscious mind. The one power which includes the new causation is always operating for and through me, your name here. As I am a perfect manifestation of this power, both consciously and subconsciously, I am always creating, drawing to myself and participating in the most perfect 
circumstance for my own fulfillment, including everything I need and want, and for the good of all, according to the free will of all, and so it must be. After you have established the process as operative in your life, you may still work words of power, statements when the need arises, but now your state-specific goals as minimum effects of the new causation, specifically such and such, and release negative specifics also as minimum effects. Many people prefer not to work on this level until they have spent long periods of time absorbing all of the basic words of power work. It is not necessary to set up the new causation in this way. You may prefer simply to acknowledge its future existence in your life as potential, and certainly it is not advisable to do this or any work until you have absorbed and understood it completely, until it rings your inner bell of truth. One final point. The new causation in all words of power can work backwards as well as forwards in time. Basically, this means that when you take responsibility for changing your future and present, karma, you positively affect your past karma as well. The further implications of such work on past karma are vast, and it is not necessary to go into them here. They belong in a more advanced book, and are indeed excellently discussed in Jane Roberts' The Nature of Personal Reality. Suffice it to say for now that it is possible to clean one's karma, past, present, and future, since there are infinite potential positive future circumstances to be found through infinity of solutions. There are also infinite potential positive past circumstances just waiting to be remembered and drawn upon. Up until now, we have focused on the individual, on the self, in the process of working positive magic for transformation. Now it is time to widen the magic circle and to see how the use of positive can work for others, for our loved ones, our communities, our planet, and beyond. This concludes Marian Weinstein's beautiful discussion of affirmations, words of power, the words of self-transformation. There's some important lessons here. It's not just the affirmation. It's how you say it, what it affects. If you're coming from a place where you do not violate their free will and you are for the good of all, those two little additions are so important understanding the intention, understanding the difference between form and essence is very important. It's one thing to have a thousand dollars. It's another thing to be abundant. So everybody learns this process as they go about learning to create their reality. This is taking you to the next level so you don't have to go through all those ups and downs. She's literally explaining a lot of the things that you will encounter as you begin to create your reality and if you go back and listen to this again, you're going to save so much time in the mistakes that you'll make. And she explains where are your motivations coming from, what it is that you're actually manifesting, and the difference between manifesting a form and manifesting an essence are so important. And the way that you manifest it, be careful what you wish for, because you will get it. And oftentimes it can work against you. And so by just adding these little extra things to your words of power, you can manifest a result that actually works perfectly for you in perfect timing, in perfect fulfillment. And so this is a good outline. If you want to create your own affirmation specific to your situation, she's giving you an outline here. The difference is you want to make sure you say your name specifically when you call out your name. So I definitely recommend this. I was so excited to read this. It's so clear and accurate. And it's true when we look back at civilizations and the advancement of certain religions, some were supplicators and some were learning how to give affirmations. So it's not about mindless repetition. Mindless repetition means that you have doubt. As she said, you only have to do it a couple times. But the idea of Makaru is so powerful. Each of us are reaching that point of Makaru and you will be at a point, especially when your throat chakra opens, where you are speaking the words of God with every word you say. And so every word becomes much more powerful and you have disastrous results when it is opened and you say the negative things. And so now all you got to do is take it out of the law. It is incredibly empowering to have this ability to take the upcoming negative result out of the law. 
I'd love to get your impressions of these affirmations and these teachings. And if it helped you in any way, please let me know. In any case, I love you all so very much. And I'm sending my thoughts of love and joy to you. And with my words of power, I proclaim that there is one power. I proclaim that this power is perfect love, abundance, and fulfillment. And I proclaim that you, listening to me, specifically you, yeah, you, are a perfect manifestation of this power. The power working for you and through you provides you all the abundance and fulfillment and perfection and joy which is rightfully yours. You draw to yourself and create in your life all that you need in the world of form to fulfill your needs. This may come specifically in the form of money. And I hereby release all cause, effect, manifestation, form, and essence and any channel within you which may have been preventing the appropriate flow of abundance in your life. And I draw upon the balance of resources in the universe for the good of all, according to the free will of all. And you affirm your own wisdom in understanding your needs and how to fulfill them. And you call to yourself just enough resources, knowing you deprive none and are not deprived yourself. You have just enough. And so must it be. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. Welcome to The Reality Revolution.